I want to just share with you briefly. I, if, you want, if you want to get me to cry, all you got to do is you got to show me one of those videos where, where a kid is sitting in class and all of a sudden the door opens up and it's a mom or dad who's coming home from the military. And uh, there was a great one the other day. It's a big prim and proper businessman, and he's sitting in this important meeting, and his Marine son comes in, and he's whispering to everybody, you don't tell him, and he knocks on the door, and he knocks on the door, and he knocks on the door, and finally the father who is running this important business meeting comes to that door, and when the door opens up and he sees who it is, he could care less what he just left because of what he had entered into. Church. Don't be, don't, don't be hindered to worship God full out because, well, somebody might think, well, that's... And I realize some of us were raised to believe you don't have a coat and a tie on and you're not standing still and, and, a, and attention, then God doesn't really get it. God doesn't care about that. Remember what David said to his wife. David, you're the king. Act like the king. He goes... I'm a child of the Most High God. I am a friend of God. There's going to be a song about it. I'm going, to, I'm going to dance for joy because of who he is. Well, I, I might not like that. Too bad. But Well, the people who follow you might not like that. Too bad. Church, we just want to worship God in spirit and in truth. And really, you can only worship in spirit and truth. Anything else is just pretend, and that's where we're going to be today. Today, we're in James chapter 3. We're beginning James chapter 3. And, um, you know, if anybody here can tell me without any hesitation at all, I completely understand free will. I completely understand the sovereignty of God. I completely understand how they work together. You're kidding yourself, and you're kidding me. <laughs> I believe in both of those things. I believe they're both in the Bible. I don't know how God works all that out, but I believe that he does. And I'm okay with the fact that God understands one or two things that I have not yet comprehended. When we look at James, so many people, and me included, always looked at James as one of those, you know, spank me because I'm not doing everything I could do. When we stop and we really think about James got to see the passionate side of Jesus every day of his life. He got to see the passionate side of Jesus. He saw Jesus in a way and in, in a situation that you and I just can only imagine. Because he was Jesus' little brother. Long before Jesus was on the preaching circuit, Jesus was laying in the bed next to James, talking to him. James, did you have a bad dream? James, let's talk about that. James, I love you. James, do you need... J James got to be with Jesus in a way that I, I would love to be able to be with him. So I, I just want to say a couple things. Here's the question. Am I saved by faith or am I saved by works? Hopefully by now you figured out the answer is I am saved by faith. So that no man would boast, it's not about works. The law, nobody could keep up with it. You might have gotten closer than I got, but you still can't keep the law. That's why it's there, is to show us that we can't keep that. Am I saved by faith or by works? Faith. But it's a working faith. It's a faith that is so real, it actually produces fruit. It's not just a, oh yeah, yeah, I, oh yeah, I'm, I'm with you. You go on ahead though. Uh, yeah, I'm with you. Oh, uh, you want me to carry that? Uh, I don't want to carry it because I might not show up for quite a while. It's, it's a faith that causes us to work. It causes us to move and to do all these things. So if I'm saved by faith, then my works don't matter. No, your works do matter because they demonstrate your faith. If you have no works, you probably need to go back to the faith bank and make sure there's actually something there. The works bank can be as full as you want it to be. If the faith bank is empty, you're hosed. But if your faith bank is full, your work banks is going to begin to fill up as well. But if I'm saved by faith, shouldn't my works just supernaturally become good and right? I was sitting there. I was lost. 
I was sin, I was a sinner, I was blind, Jesus took me in, and you know what? I've never had, the, I've never had a bad thought again. I've never been tempted to do anything again. I, I, I just, from then on, it was the straight and narrow, was the, that was the path for me. I just was, no, because we work it out. I heard, I heard somebody say this one time, and I love it. They said that the Christian life is like buying a house. A couple of y'all have recently bought houses. Some of you are trying to buy houses. Some of you would like to sell houses. If you do, uh, Kelly would be happy to help you back there. Uh, Throw a little plug in for Kelly. Uh, But I love this, what they said about buying a house is like salvation. Here's how. There's a day that you go to the closing attorney, and you sit down, and you sign, and you give them whatever down payment. That's like That's like salvation. It's the beginning. It's the, it's the door. It's the, it's the entrance in. And there will hopefully come a time in 15 or 30 years or somewhere in between there where you go out and you, you open your grill and you, you, put the, you put the mortgage down there that you've been paying on each month and you put lighter fluid and you light it and you go, yes, I own the house. That is, that, that's glorification. Glory to God, the house actually now is mine. When people go, do you own your house? Well, me and the bank. Me, me, you know, I, the bank owns more of it than I own right now, but, but me. So there will come a time when you'll own it, lock, stock, and barrel. That's glorification. But between signing the papers and burning the note, that's sanctification. That's making the monthly payments. That's fixing the air condition when it goes down. That's working out owning this home. I think that's a pretty good, a pretty good illustration of what salvation is like. When we, when we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, when the Holy Spirit comes and resides in us, we are saved. We'll never be more saved than then. But there it does come a time when we go through, we leave this life and we step into the next life, and all of a sudden, everything catches up to us. We get the glorified body, we have, we have a new mind. All that stuff is, is just so much more aware because we are now completely out of the presence of evil and completely in the presence of the holy. In the meantime, which is where you and I are right now, we're in this process of sanctification. I, you know what? What I just did, the thought I just had, the statement I just made, the deed that I just did was wrong. How do I know it was wrong? Because the Holy Spirit lives inside me, and the Holy Spirit was going, that was not right. That, that, that thought right there, it wasn't, it, wasn't how, it wasn't how I think, and I want you to think like I think. So I'm going to help you change your thinking to where it matches my thinking. That deed you just did, that is not a Jesus deed. That is a fleshly deed. We want to get you away from fleshly deeds and get you onto Jesus deeds, because trust me, Jesus deeds are better. They're also sometimes pretty dangerous, by the way, for those of you who haven't figured that out yet. So Jesus has taken my sin. I still have to confront that sin and deal with it here on earth. And so James is, James, just, just imagine for a minute, what has James been, what has James heard all the last three years, four years, five years leading up to when he writes the book of James? He saw Jesus' whole three years of ministry. He didn't buy in completely that Jesus was the Messiah until after his resurrection. And Jesus came to James, and they had a wonderful conversation, I'm sure. So, 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 but what had James heard spoken about Jesus? Probably some pretty harsh stuff. How many of y'all have ever heard, overheard somebody talking bad about your kids, your mom, your brother, your sister, your church? How does that make you feel, Jill? Just, oh, I just love them. I want to love them to death. Yeah. So imagine what James had heard come out of people's mouths about Jesus. And now James is at this point, he has basically become the leader of the New Testament church. And it's kind of a new thing, but, but, but he's, he's the leader of it. Because remember, he's the one that they went to and they said, hey, look, we've got, some, we've got some Gentile believers. What should we tell them they have to do to follow Christ? Do they need to do circumcision? He said, no, 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 we, no, no, it's not legalism. They need, to, they need to follow Jesus. They need to do what Jesus did. So, so, he's, he's, so what had he heard about, said about this church of his brother, of his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? What had he heard? He'd heard some things. So as we get into chapter 3, I think we're, gonna, we're seeing the result of what James is dealing with in the fact of here's what's been said uh, to him, about him, 
uh, about Jesus, about the church, inside the church, outside the church. And so he comes to this, uh, uh, chapter 3, verse 1. He says this, Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment. Now, next Sunday, Terry Tripp is going to be here. I'm looking forward to Terry. Uh, I've heard some of the stuff that he's done on YouTube. I think it's incredible. Uh, has anybody here ever been, been heard beside under Terry's teaching? Okay. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. Here's one thing I can almost, almost completely promise you that will not happen after Terry is done. I will not come up and re-preach what he just preached. I will not come up and re-teach. I always... I got to be honest, that always just made me mad. We would have somebody come, we'd have this evangelist come, and he would come and he would speak, and then whenever he would go down, then our pastor would come up and he would talk for the next 10 or 15 minutes, either correcting some theological thing, or, well, I want to give you my take on it, or what you should have said was you should, it's like, dude, you should have just preached, or, or, or let this dude do it, or you do it, but don't, you know, you don't need to tag team why is that? Why, why is it that there are times that we want to make sure that we are the last voice somebody hears? Well, it might have a little to do with pride. It might have a little to do with arrogance. It might have a little to do with, hey, yeah, what he said was fine. But the main thing is I want you to hear what I just said because what I have to say is way more important than anything anybody could ever say. There's a little bit of this going on because, remember, this is a fairly new church. And wait, wait a minute, you know, yeah, there's, there's John, and, and there's, there's Paul, and there's Peter, and there's James, and, and all these bigwigs. And, well, how do I get to be a bigwig in this new organization? How, do I, how can I rise to the top? Well, he, there are a lot of people who are stepping up and going, hey, I want to teach. I'd like to speak. I, I wanna, can, I, can I do a special class? Because I have this favorite thing of mine that I've really, I believe that this, this little um, minute detail needs to become an entire church study on, you know, whether, whether you part your hair on the left or the right. Because I believe in Scripture, I can prove to you, it's, it's that kind of stuff. And James is saying, look, don't rush out to be a teacher, because those of us who teach, we're under a stricter judgment. Church, I am under a stricter judgment than you are, because I stand here every Sunday and I teach. I pray that the Holy Spirit doesn't let me say anything that's me, only what's Him. Does that mean that... <laughs> I've never spoken anything that wasn't me. No. But I'm also praying that the Holy Spirit doesn't let stick to you anything that's not supposed to go, that's not of him. I, I study, I pray, I don't get up here to, you know, hey, how can I work this into my sermon so people will go, hey, I should do something for pastor. It's, it's not that at all. There's a stricter, there's a stricter thing. I, if I don't move on, I won't get farther. Um, I've done 500 sermons at least at Gateway. It's amazing how uh, you can say one sentence out of 500 sermons and somebody just stops coming to church. It's like, where would you go? Well, you said, well, it's like, yeah, but what about the 500 sermons where I didn't say anything that bothered you? It's like, no, no, you just get the, you just get the one shot. Okay, so um, that's, I'm not bitter. I'm just telling you how it is. I really am not. I understand. Look, I always tell people, if you're looking for a reason to leave any church, you never have to look farther than the pastor, because we're human, and we will give you a reason to leave a church. I promise. I try not to, but I always have. Verse 2, for we, we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. Now, remember, Jewish people, they kind of talk in this, they, they, they say something as if it's a possibility, but it's really not a possibility. So, so if you're perfect, and we all know you're not, it's that kind of thing. But this perfect word, it, it means mature. It means you've come all the way around. You've learned. That is the goal. The goal is for you to be closer to Jesus, to look more like Jesus today than you looked the day that you became a Christian. That is the goal. That's why we've been called to become disciples. And disciple, discipline, same root word there. There is work to be done in becoming, to becoming the follower of Christ that we're meant to be. So, um, the, um, we, all, we all do it, stumbling. It is possible to get better at not stumbling. As a matter of fact, we're supposed to work on not stumbling more every day. Verse 3, uh, now if we put the bits into the horse's mouths so that they will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. You take a 95-pound jockey, 
You put them on a 1,500-pound horse and, and say, go as fast as you can go in a circle, okay? So, and what is it that's controlling? It's just, it's just the bridle. It's just the bit. It, that's, that's all that's, 